welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I um, read, uh, can I say I binge read your book? <laughs> it, was, it was your first one, 13, 13 things uh, that mentally strong people don't do, <laughs> right? I love that you've taken a twist on it. And I just started reading and I couldn't stop. And I'm, luckily it was on my my Kindle because or else I think my highlighter would have just like worn out right away. Um, thank you for everything that you do, especially with your Very Well Mind podcast and the website as well. Um, you really help us um, work on ourselves and figure out how we can you know, be better at this. So thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I appreciate everybody who uh, supports my work for sure. Um, so it, it's very clear through all your work that you want to help us be mentally strong. Can we start off by understanding, because we're going to talk about that today. So how do you define that? Oh, good question to start <laughs> with. So it's really about the way you think, feel, and behave. Mm. And it has to do with the thoughts are all about knowing that sometimes your brain lies to you. It's not always realistic and that you can prove your brain wrong and trusting that you can do that. When your brain says you can't do something, sometimes you can. And the emotional part is knowing that we have some control over our emotions and you don't always have to be happy. Sometimes it's about accepting sadness, allowing yourself to be anxious, but knowing that you don't have to be stuck in those emotions too. When they don't serve you well, you have the ability to make a shift. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to our behavior, it's about knowing what your values are and then acting according to those values. So when you put all three of those things together, you have mental strength. <laughs> well, I, I, I love that you said that we don't always have to be happy or, you know, okay with everything that's happening because sometimes we have this misconception and I think you addressed it at the beginning, right? Like what it is not. Um, because we, we do think that when we're struggling or we're not regulating our emotions very well, that we're not strong, but we're allowed to have those moments from what I understand. That's the thing is sometimes people come into my therapy office and they'll say even something like I'm, I struggle with anxiety. So therefore I can't be mentally strong or I want to be mentally strong because I have depression and like a mental illness doesn't make you weak. Plenty of people, you know, if we were to talk about it in terms of physical strength and physical health, it makes a lot more sense. Like if you're going to go to the gym and build physical muscle, doesn't mean you won't ever develop, say, diabetes or high cholesterol, but it can help you stay healthy. And when it comes to the our emotions specifically, sometimes people think if I'm not happy, if I'm not smiling while I'm going through tragedy, then somehow it means I'm not strong. But we should experience a whole vast array of emotions. And there's this misconception that emotions are either positive or negative. Yes, it's not yes. true. All emotions serve a purpose. Your sadness uh, can help you honor something you lost. Your anxiety can keep you safe so that you don't enter a dangerous situation. We're supposed to have all of these emotions. And even the ones that we would consider positive normally, like excitement, there's a downside to it. If you get really excited about a get rich quick scheme, you might fall prey to it <laughs> because you don't realize that there's a downside to it. So it's really important to know that you can have all of these emotions, but but when they're not serving you well, you can notice it. So when you're like, okay, I, I'm so sad. I can't get out of bed for three weeks at a time. That's not healthy. Or I'm so anxious. I can't pay attention at work. I need to do something about that. And sometimes it's small steps, self-help kind of things we can do. Sometimes it's something big. Maybe you need to go talk to a, a professional, but there's always things we can do to help manage our emotions. I, I want to touch on that self-help word because I think it's very popular. We, we, we want to be our best selves. We want to be perfect, right? I think sometimes we have this idea and the way you've approached it is, and I, again, I think you do talk about this at the beginning, but it's not, it's very easy for us to know, oh, I'm good at doing this. Or I want to do that. Or I'd love to have a better schedule or I'd, I'd love to have a routine around exercise, but sometimes we don't take a lot of time to realize what things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing that are contributing to these bad habits or the struggles that we have. Yeah, when I was thinking about it, as you know, as a therapist, I was like, all right, they taught me to build on people's strengths. I was told when somebody comes in your therapy office, figure out what they're doing well and tell them to keep doing those things. And I thought mm. that's great because you know we all want to know what's working. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, you know, if I were going to go see a physical trainer and they told me to run on the treadmill, well, I know I can run on the treadmill for an hour, but if I were to just drink a cup of hot chocolate on the way home... I've completely outdone that one hour. I have to run four more hours to burn it back off. And so I thought if somebody didn't tell me, hey, by the way, there's a solution. There's a way to work smarter and not just harder. I'd be really mad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so often people will say things like, well, just eat vegetables. That's great. But if I eat it alongside 17 jelly donuts every day, it doesn't matter how much broccoli I eat. I'm still going to struggle. And so I just really wanted to point out to people, we all have so many good habits 
and yet we still think we need to do more and everybody mm -hmm. keeps piling them up and thinking I'm not doing enough. Yeah. So I just wanted to say, let's just eliminate some of your very worst emotional, mental habits, behavioral habits that can make all the good habits you already have that much more effective. That way we're not in this counterproductive kind of hamster wheel where we just feel like I just can't get ahead. <laughs> exactly. And you're right. We keep piling it on. We want more of these good habits, but we need to stop and think, where do we begin if right now we feel like things aren't working well, we're not sure where to begin with your definition of being mentally strong. We're like, okay, I, I don't think I'm there. Sometimes there's a lack of insight, right? Sometimes you're not sure where to begin. So how, how do you start this whole process? So, you know, yeah, it boils down to self-awareness and figuring out well, what, like, what sort of mental habits do I have? Maybe you call yourself names. Maybe you start right there with, mm -hmm. okay, I put myself down sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's an emotional habit. You lose your temper or whenever you're anxious, you, um, you know, pace back and forth. You do something that's mm -hmm. not helpful. You stay up all night researching something because you think if you can just find an answer, you'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Or maybe uh, it has to do with your behavior. Maybe you spend way too much money on online shopping, but really this problem is that you're lonely and you're just sitting on the couch at home and you're not doing anything. So just take, a, take some inventory. And sometimes mm -hmm. in the therapy office, we'll have people just for a whole week kind of log their behavior, their mood, their thoughts. And you recognize some patterns pretty quickly. Like I call myself names and then I beat myself up and I go home from work and I throw myself on the couch and I don't do anything healthy all night. Whatever it is, it usually becomes pretty easy to recognize some patterns and you think, okay, how do you break that pattern? Sometimes it's just changing your thinking. If you stop calling yourself names, you feel better. When you feel better, you do better. Yeah. Sometimes it's about saying, okay, well, I, I, you know, it's a lifelong thinking pattern. What can I do differently? Sometimes it's about changing your behavior first. If somebody says, I really want to be healthier, but I don't know what to do. And they beat themselves up about it. Get up and go for a walk. Mm -hmm. Taking action first sometimes helps us and it can shift how we feel too. So I'm always a fan of behavioral experiments. Keep experimenting until you figure out what works for you. I'm taking notes. I, I always suggest to parents that they take notes about their child to understand what they're seeing exter externally as the behavior, but what's the underlying emotion that could be contributing to that. So we can do the same thing, I'm assuming, with ourselves, right? Just like you said, noticing patterns. And maybe you haven't realized, you know, that something's happening during your day that's contributing to the end of your day and how you act and feel. Um, but I, 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 I'm a, the scientist in me always wants to take notes and collect data. <laughs> that's just it. And it's, yeah. you know, most of us don't ever do that. We don't ever log no. like, oh. but you might quickly notice. And sometimes it could just be about one, scoring your mood one to 10 and check in with yourself five or six times a day, one to 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm an eight now. I'm a four now. Mm -hmm. And you might notice, gee, and come mid morning, I'm always in a bad mood yeah. or I'm always <laughs> anxious by about the time I get out of work. Well, what's going on then? Well, mm -hmm. I have to fight traffic and then my everything's hectic when I get home, whatever it is, but you'll start to notice these certain patterns. And then you can say, okay, how do I break free from that? Mm. Your, with your first book, it was interesting because I'm reading it as somebody who's helping parents. And I feel that in addition to it being 13 things that mentally strong people don't do, it should be before becoming a parent. <laughs> because I was reading through them and I was like, this is what we, we talk about through research. This is what I share with parents. And then there's the parenting one. But I feel like this one is the pre because, you know, I, I, just, just to mention a few, but like um, we don't make mistakes over and over again, or we don't resent other people's success as parents. I find that if we work on that, it makes parenting a little bit easier. So it's almost like a pre <laughs> the prequel. Yeah, It definitely does. Because <laughs> otherwise, if you fall into these patterns, that's what you're teaching your kids. And as parents, exactly. Yeah. You know, you model these things for kids, they pick up on it. And that's how they learn how to be in the world too, is just mm -hmm. by watching you. If you keep making the same mistakes over and over, guaranteed they will too, or you feel sorry for yourself, you're going to teach your kids to do the exact exactly. same thing. And, and that's why it's so important for parents to work on themselves before becoming a parent, because then we, we're bringing this and we're modeling certain things, things that we might not even realize that can contribute to the child adapting or, or starting these habits that we have. Yes. And obviously none of us are going to become perfect people before we end up having kids, no. but, you know, having some self-awareness about that and yeah. knowing what are my habits? Cause we grew up with these. So most of us, these things have become normalized and we don't even necessarily know what's normal and what's not. And most of us, our parents didn't sit down and teach us about feelings oh. and they didn't <laughs> talk about certain things um, that we now know so much more about. And we live in a world where it's not just about kids being seen and, and not heard or we don't use we don't make it such a authoritarian mm -hmm. relationship anymore for the most part we know that it's important to acknowledge kids feelings and that we should be talking about those things but how do you do that 
Yeah. And I talk to a, a room full of adults sometimes, and these could be master's level CEOs, really successful people. And I'll say, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, write down as many feeling words as you can. And they're like so excited to dive in and they come up with an average of five words. Once you get mm -hmm. past like happy, sad, mad, you start to run out because we don't talk about feelings enough. And yet we talk about emotional intelligence and yes. parents want to teach their kids about feelings, but most of us are not quite there yet. We don't even have the language to say how we're feeling today because we don't use those words very often in our everyday conversations. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we have to learn them first. And then when we teach our child, like parents will often tell me, my five-year-old is having these big emotions and is acting out, but they know they're able to identify like happy, um, joy, you know, sadness and anger. I'm like, well, there are more than those feelings. But then once we know how to um, identify them, do we know what it feels like as a child? Do, are we teaching them what it feels like to experience anger? And then, and that anger in one situation might be different from another one. And then what do you do with this anger, right? We have to learn all of these skills. And my generation, I could speak for my, myself, we were told to kind of like squash that. Don't just like anything that was uh, not happiness within our home was like, how dare you? How dare you be feel like mad or sad about this? You know, you, you shouldn't just, just get out, stop being a baby, just move on. And we didn't learn how to deal with these uncomfortable, not negative, but uncomfortable emotions. Is that a good word for those emotions? <laughs> It, it is because same thing, right? If I was worried about something um, as a kid, like, gee, I have a science fair project coming up and I have to present in front of the class. The response I would get was just don't worry about it. You'll yes. be fine. Well, yes, no, exactly. I am worried. But I, I am. Yeah. With, you know, this anxious feeling or parents will come into my therapy office and tell me that their kid's anger is really bad because their kid hits. Mm. Well, they're confused between angry feelings and aggressive behavior. Mm. And yes, hitting is not good, but angry feelings aren't necessarily a bad thing. When we're angry, sometimes it gives us courage. When we're mm. mad about something, sometimes we want to create change. But we have to teach kids, okay, when you're angry, what's an alternative? Instead of hitting your brother, what could you do instead? Maybe you use your words. Maybe you color a picture. You go for a run, whatever it is. But we can start teaching kids those things. But yes, we have to know how to do those things first, too. <laughs> yes. I'm thinking of the, the your, your first two books that I read. And how, I, I'm just curious about this, but how do you come up with 13 points that are just so on point in terms of how what we have to change how, how what's the process for you is it like ex a certain amount of years is it experience mixed with clients like how do you come up with these 13 extremely important points <laughs> Well, you know, for my first book, I, I never intended to be an author. I had written the 13 things mentally strong people don't do. It was just a letter to myself based on what I had learned as a therapist. Wow. But through my own journey, I had lost my mom when I was 23. When I was 26, my husband died. And as a therapist, I was just studying people. I felt like I'm supposed to be teaching people who walk into my office. But on the other hand, I just thought, I have this revolving door of case studies all day long of people who are going through hardship. Mm -hmm. What helps some of them more than others? And I realized pretty early on, it wasn't always about, about what people did. Sometimes it was about what they didn't do. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know for my own enrichment, what are these things? But I wanted to carry it forward and teach other people too. And so uh, that's really how I learned it. And then uh, when I was faced with my uh, inevitable, I guess my father-in-law's prognosis, he'd di been diagnosed with cancer. His prognosis was bad. We knew he had maybe a couple of months to live at most. And that was when I wrote a letter to myself about what mentally strong people don't do. And there just happened to be 13 things on the list mm -hmm. and published it online, sort of thinking, ah, if it helps me, maybe it'll help somebody else. And if you've read the book, you know, the story, it went viral. And then I, mm -hmm. I started writing books, but there, in the first book, there was no magic meant to be in the number 13. That was just <laughs> my, my own letter. But after I wrote the first book, parents kept asking me, look, how do we teach this to our kids? Mm -hmm. And if I, if I had learned this sooner, it could have changed the entire course of my life. And so I, I wanted to write a kid's book, but I thought that's not the next step because if I write a book for a 10 year old and he, he reads it and then he puts it back on the shelf, nothing's going to change. I felt like I needed to write the parenting book first because yeah. I wanted to help parents know how do you implement these things in your house. So I took the 13 things from the original book and just made it like the parenting style of <laughs> now, how do you, how do you teach this? And then when I, I wrote the women's book, that was just about women specifically. But then when I wrote the kids book, I just wanted to put it in terms of, you know, what do strong kids do? Cause I didn't want to say what not to do as a kid, but I wanted to focus on yes. <laughs> here are the healthy habits, you know, instead of telling your kid, don't run, it's helpful with kids to say, use your walking feet. <laughs> I wanted the book to be about that, but 
Um, I just try to pick the most important 13 things that, um, that I think tend to hold people back. And those were the ones that I had seen in my therapy office over the years and ones that I know resonated in my own life too. One from your parenting, a point from your parenting, uh, book was about, um, uh, I want to say it properly, but sh yeah, shielding them from pain. And the mm -hmm. reason why I'm bringing that up is we often hear about parents wanting their child to be resilient and, but then we also want to shield them from pain. <laughs> so how do we, how do we balance that? How do we include that sort of not, or, or avoid that as a parent? Well, I hear so many parents say things like, well, kids are resilient, mm. but they're not born resilient. They mm. only become resilient because we teach them how. And sometimes I think there's that misconception that my kid will bounce back. So if they fail at stuff, that's fine. They'll get over it but we have to teach them how to do it. And so I see some parents that kind of want to throw their kids out there to the wolves without teaching them first. Or I even see some parents who like want to create some kind of hardship for their kids on purpose just to toughen them up. Mm. You don't need to do that. Life is tough enough. Mm. <laughs> but on the other end, um, you know, it's tough to watch your kid be in pain or to be struggling or when they're sad, when they don't get invited to the birthday party or they don't get picked for the team or they are struggling in math. It's heartbreaking to watch, but knowing that allowing them to go through those painful emotions can be our best opportunity to teach them and to say, Hey, here's what we can do, or here are some strategies, or what do you think you should do? And depending on how old they are, but they really need to learn that. I teach college classes as well. And I'll see the college freshmen who come in who really have never been taught so many things about their emotions mm -hmm. and they weren't taught about pain and they struggle so much that first year of college. A lot of them don't make it because they don't know what to do when you have a fight with your roommate or you fail a test or mm -hmm. you don't have anybody to sit with. You're lonely on Friday night. All of those sorts of problems. They don't have the problem solving skills. They don't have the emotional skills to cope with it. And nine times out of 10, I suspect it's because their parents did them a disservice. Their parents, it was too uncomfortable for parents to watch their kids do go through those yeah. things. So in order to relieve their own anxiety, they stepped in and they solved the problems. They mm -hmm. cheered them up. They said, oh, let's go for ice cream. Don't be sad and did everything <laughs> they could with the best of intentions, but ultimately it holds kids back in life. So if a parent's listening to this and realize and realizes I, I might have been, I, I think I am that parent. Where, where do you begin your journey? If you yourself are uncomfortable with these emotions, how can we support our child to be okay during these difficult emotions just like with ourselves about um as a parent name your own emotions maybe you're really anxious right now because your a child didn't get invited to the party or your child is struggling with something at school and your anxiety goes up just acknowledging it we know when you put a name to your feelings it takes some of the sting out of it and then to have conversations with your kids ask them, how are you feeling about this? Because sometimes we project our own anxieties and our own concerns onto yeah. kids and they may not have them. We're thinking, oh my gosh, they must be feeling horrible or this is awful or how anxious they must be. They might not necessarily be feeling that way, but they might be worried about something completely different. Sometimes the little things that we think are little are really big to kids. So mm -hmm talking to them, asking them, checking in. If you have a kid who's not going to name their feelings, it's not going to 14 year old boy. If you've never had conversations about feelings, it's not going to sit across the table and be like, you know how I'm feeling right now, Yeah. <laughs> but you might be able to ask them scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? And they mm -hmm. might say, you know, I'm a solid four today. And then you can have <laughs> okay. a conversation about that much easier than you can about that. And I find with um, older kids too, you can ask them about their friends. Like, gosh, do you think any of your friends are struggling with math class or do you think any of your friends are having a hard time because of covid whatever it is and they'll be really quick to say you know what all of my friends are having a hard time with and they'll fill in the blank but i guarantee your kids having a hard time with it too it's just harder to, for them to say i'm struggling with but they can say their friends are struggling with something that's true that's such a good point and i i think on that along those lines um with mistakes right so we i think we we don't want our kids to make mistakes. I'm thinking back to my own education and, and, and the ones I, of, of kids I see in my environment. Like you, we just want them to do so well and we like push them to perfection when it comes to grades. And then they make a mistake. And instead of us embracing that and saying, well, that was a learning opportunity, we, we look at that as, well, you could do better next time, right? Some, some of us, and <laughs> that's how I was raised. How can we approach that? Again, if we were raised a certain way and we want them to do well, I think we, we do it unintentionally and with love because we want them to succeed later on. But how do we come down from that and realize that mistakes are really important for them? 
Yeah, that's a tough one because we do. We want our kids to do well. And when they get 100 on a test, we want to be like, cheer them on and be like, my goodness, you're so smart. And then they get the lower grade on a test. And we want to say that exact same thing. Like, yeah. what do you do better next time? But mm. one of the most powerful things I know of is to sit around the table on Friday night and you ask your kids, hey, what'd you fail at this week? And when they <laughs> tell you, like, you know, I didn't make the team. I got cut from this or I tried that experiment and it didn't work like high five for having the courage to try to do something that was really hard yeah. because we know that kids easily get in the pattern of only wanting to do things they're good at so if they try yeah, this out for soccer and they're not the best kid on the soccer team they might be really tempted to quit or mm -hmm. they might not dare to try playing an instrument if they know that it's too much work and it's hard at first and you're going to sound terrible when you first practice it <laughs> or when it comes to like grades so often we talk about how would you do on your grades but kids get tempted to, to even cheat mm -hmm. because they want to get a really good grade because yeah. they, it's, you know, it's embarrassing to, yeah. to not get a good grade at school. So we know that most parents say, yes, I absolutely value honesty. And yet we know most kids cheat. Yes. And when we ask parents, sometimes um, I'll do this. I speak at school sometimes and I'll speak to the kids during the day and the parents at night. And I asked a, a room full of students, like, if your parents came to parent teacher conference tonight, would they be more proud if the teacher said you're the smartest kid in the school or that you're the kindest kid in the school? And like almost every kid in the class is all, no, my parents want me to be the smartest kid. Oh, <laughs> and then, okay. And yeah. then at night I'll ask the parents the same question and probably just as many of the parents will say, I want the kindest kid in the class. Oh. <laughs> and we'll talk about that. And I'll say, you know, why is it that maybe some of your kids think that they don't know exactly what your values are. Well, for most parents, they ask their kids, how'd you do in math today? How was your mm -hmm. science test? We don't really ask them, who are you kind to? What'd that's you do true. at recess today to be kind to somebody? Mm -hmm. So kids get that all mixed up because that's what we talk about the most. We spend three hours doing homework, but not even 10 seconds asking them about kindness. So true. what do they think that you value the most? Exactly. And nothing wrong in that. That's just sort of how life works is that we we go to works during the day, but that money might not be our most valuable thing in life, but you have to pay the bills because you need to live. But just knowing what are your family values? And when it comes to failure and messing up, how do you view that? And how do you talk about it? And do you tell your kids when you fail? Mm -hmm. Most adults I know, like, I don't want to tell my kids I didn't get that, that promotion, or I don't want my kids to know that I'm not perfect or that I messed up. But those are all opportunities to have conversations. When you mess up, you have an opportunity to own up to it. We know most mm -hmm. kids will hide their mistakes, right? That they don't want you to know. So they'll go to great lengths to pretend like it didn't happen or <laughs> crumple the paper up so you don't see yeah. it. And so we don't want them to do that. We want them to know if you make a mistake, be honest about it and that's okay. And you can own it and then you can do better. I love the idea of sharing these mistakes with them because it's just so important them, for them to see that we're not perfect and we're right. navigating this world with the same kind of tools and feelings around certain things. So it's okay to have that. Um, I, I had given a workshop a couple of weeks ago and there was a father that really stood out to me. He said, um, I had told him about like, you know, um, assessing like what you struggle with when it comes to emotions or what you excel at. And he's like, can I do that in front of my child? Like on about my emotions? And I was like, of course. And he's like, well, what if I struggle with anger? And, but I'm saying it out loud to them. Aren't, aren't, shouldn't I be that authoritative figure that gets everything right rather than like showing them that I have weaknesses. And it's like, but these emotions make you human, right? So we have to move away from this idea of like perfection and especially emotions that make you weak or, or, you know, it's, I think it's so important for us to model and share everything with our kids, obviously everything to, uh, you know, the, as long as it's developmentally appropriate. Um, but I'm thinking about the stories that you were just sharing now and uh, in terms of like mistakes. And I'm thinking of an environment with a younger child. What are certain things that we might be doing unintentionally? Uh, I'm thinking about like every three draw, every drawing that your child shows you and it's like the best drawing in the world <laughs> is, you know, we talk a lot about this positive feedback. Um, I'd love to hear from you in terms of like how that might contribute to our child later on. Yeah, that's a good question about, <laughs> about coloring. Because we all do these certain things. So your yeah. kid colors the tree purple. And a lot of parents are like, no, the tree's oh, green. Yeah. We originally start correcting them with what's yeah. right and what's not, right? It's true. <laughs> and then we do that thing of, wow, you're the best color colorer in the whole world. Or that's the be most beautiful picture ever. And, yeah. and uh, you know, we're like, okay, if you tell your four-year-old their picture's beautiful, you're not doing any damage. But on the other hand, it's good for kids to learn to assess their own work. So you can ask them, what's your favorite part about this picture you just colored? And they might say, I love the purple tree. Wow, that's great that you love the purple tree. 
Is there anything that that you wish you would have done differently? You could even ask them, did you make any mistakes on this one? And they might say, yeah, I accidentally colored the bird brown and I didn't mean to. Oh, okay. But, you know, and just talk about the, all of those sorts of things with their picture, but you can ask them questions rather than telling them what to do. Mm. Or sometimes you can just kind of be the radio announcer. You sit down next to your kid, like, oh, look, you're coloring the tree purple. Oh, now you're picking up the red crayon and you're coloring the sky red. Instead of like directing them, we try to make everything yes. a learning activity. We take the crayon away. No, the sun is yellow. It's not purple. <laughs> and, um, you know, just let kids create, let them be creative. And it doesn't have to, not everything has to be a learning opportunity in the way that we think it should. Sometimes just let kids go and, and acknowledge that and then ask them what they think about it. And that open-endedness is where they learn the most, right? And learn to trust themselves and to motivate themselves to do what feels best for them, which is going to be important later on. Right. And yeah. I'll have parents and their kids come into my therapy office and like parents, you can just see their anxiety building. The kid will be playing with a dollhouse and the kid puts the bathtub on the roof <laughs> and the parent is like, you know, hyperventilating, trying to be like, you can't put the bathtub on the roof. Well, <laughs> it's okay. You let them create, let them do their thing. And in those situations, that's all right. But then when everything falls over, they're having a hard time. That's your opportunity to say, Oh, it looks like this is really hard for you. What can we do right now? Or um, oops, everything fell over. Now, what are you going to do? Oh, look, you're mm -hmm. picking it back up. Good idea. Yes. We can cheer them on in those moments of how they recover from mistakes. And then my, my kids take Italian classes on, on Saturdays here in Montreal. We have a lot of like different languages on Saturdays that you can attend school. And it's funny because it's on zoom and I'm, I follow my, he took it last year. So four, he was four years old and now he's five. And whenever a child is asked a question, the parent, you usually hear the parents in the background, like whispering the, the, the answer to it. And if the child doesn't know, or if the pause is too long, and it, it always makes me laugh because I get it. Like when there's the pause and my son is asked a question, it's so hard because you're like, you know, that color is red or whatever it is. Like, just, just say it. And then you just like, it's so hard to step back. <laughs> That is funny. Yeah, it is because yeah. we, we want them to do well. And in our yeah. definition of doing well, it's often that succeeding and achieving stuff. But to mm -hmm. know, giving them that moment where they're thinking or maybe shouting out the wrong answer sometimes, that's okay. That's really good for them to have that experience. Exactly. Um, I, I love your podcast and you've interviewed so many amazing guests. What have you learned? I'm curious, um, something new that's not in your book that you've learned from all these interviews that for you was an important one. Oh, I love it. So I get to ask people like what makes them mentally strong, what their strategies are. And every guest we've had on the show, like I learned so much from them. We had um, Terry Cruz, who was talking about his shame that he carries around with him. And his one of his tips is he just has a picture of himself when he was a little boy. Mm -hmm. And he looks at that picture and he said, you know, then I, I realized like that little boy was a, a good person back then. And I'm still that person and that there's nothing inherently wrong with me. I've messed up, but I'm not bad. It's just, I chose to do some things that I'm not proud of in life, but that doesn't make me a bad person. Mm -hmm. Or another one that I love is we interviewed this um, Dan Gable, a wrestling coach who was an amazing wrestling coach. And there were times when he was coaching these, these young people and he said, you know, they, they messed up, they did these things and I, I was angry at them. But he said, I would just look up at the crowd and I would look for somebody who loved them. He said, if you look at somebody's mom and you're like, this kid has a mom who loves him. He's like, you just develop instant empathy and compassion for this person because you can't be mad at somebody when you're just reminded of who loves this person. And I thought, I love that. I didn't learn that in a college textbook, but what an amazing strategy. And, and so I've adopted so many of these strategies for my own. I, I love that because it's important for us to learn from each other. And sometimes we feel less alone in our journey, you know, um, and what you mentioned about Terry Crews, for, for me, it comes back to what I've been working on the past couple of years, which is the self-compassion piece. I've never worked on that. Nobody ever taught me how to do that, but only as a parent, I was like, oh, there's not a lot of self-compassion here when there's like really big chaotic moments. I'm pretty hard on myself, which I was before, but it got like <laughs> amplified so much as a parent. Um, I, I know that the parents that are listening uh, right now to this podcast, we have a, a variety, right? With parents who have a partner, some who don't have a partner, some who are foster parents. And I think that when it comes to being mentally strong, they might have different challenges. What, what can we share with these parents who like somebody who might be alone and not have, you know, feel just like I'm not in control of my emotions. I don't have time to write notes. I don't know where to begin right now. I guess to end off our conversation, how do we help or I guess, how can all your advice like help with these people who might have a lot more struggles? Yeah. So I guess 
first thought would be knowing something and doing it are two different things. I'm a therapist and I teach parents all day long about, you know, all of these skills, but I was a foster parent for years. And the things that I inherently knew yet I was supposed to do. So for instance, to Mm. let my foster child go do summer camp, I'm like, oh my gosh, no, like, you know, she's probably going to get picked on. She's going to get made fun of. And I'm like, we can't let her go. And my husband's like, you know, she'll probably have a good time. And so, and I just like, you know, my heart's racing as I'm like sending the kid off to camp. She had like the best week of her life, but I would have prevented that because I didn't want her to get hurt. So even though we're just talking about like, don't let your kids do scary things or, or it's okay to let them expose them to potentially painful things. I know it's really tough to do mm. and just recognizing within ourselves, like, all right, what are the, what's, what's hard for me? And to know that you don't have to be a perfect parent, mm. that there's so much research out there that just being a good enough parent uh, is good enough that your yeah. kids are never going to have a perfect boss, a perfect partner, a perfect roommate. So it's okay to mess up and to learn from those things. And it's really about just having a good relationship with your kids. Mm. If you have a kid that you can sit down and play with for 10 to 15 minutes a day and give them your undivided attention where you shut your phone off and you just let them know that they matter to you for those 10 to 15 minutes so much research shows that your kid will turn out okay in the end (laughs) yes and and coming out of the pandemic now we're seeing some kids you know I've been speaking to some schools here there's more like aggressive behavior and more anxiety and they don't know how to approach all this I I personally think that we didn't give parents and the kids enough tools and support during all of this um, what can we do now as parents, if we're seeing these struggles in our kids, how can we help them? Yeah, I, I agree. I feel like we, we shut down school and pe- the parents were suddenly like the teacher, the parent, the, the daycare provider, yes. and yes. they were trying to all work all at the same time and it kids was- are climbing <laughs> the walls. And yeah. Um, so <laughs> yes, I agree. After this couple of years, what a tough few mm-hmm. years, but um, a couple of things with that. I'm seeing some parents who are saying, my kid is traumatized and they're mm-hmm. treating their kids now as though their kids were traumatized. Yes, true. Some kids were not necessarily yeah. traumatized. They were like, well, that was silly. I didn't get to play soccer. I didn't get to see my friends, but they aren't necessarily damaged for life because mm-hmm. of it. But I see some parents who are treating their kids as if you've missed three years of your life. This is going to be terrible. And, yes. and we're sort of like projecting that onto yeah. the kids. Yeah. So I think that it's important to, to know that uh, not all kids were traumatized by this. A few were, but not most of them weren't. They were just, it was, life was different and it was hard, but it's not as traumatic as a life or death uh, injury or anything like that. And I also think, um, you know, to, to not worry so much about what kids missed, because I hear a lot of parents saying, well, they missed two years of school or they missed a whole year of school. Now they're so far behind. And the parents' anxiety is such that the kids are now anxious because they're like, oh, I missed all this stuff. And now I'm not going to, I don't know, get a high school diploma. But to just let kids be kids at the moment, it's okay to have fun and to not worry so much about what they missed, but to focus more on the emotional stuff rather than all of the academic stuff. Because even if you have a kid who does really well in school, if they can't control their temper when they're 18, they're not going to do very well in life. So Mm -hmm. to know these are all opportunities to teach them. And if you do have a kid who's aggressive, they're acting out, just consider it more learning opportunities what works for one kid doesn't work for everybody, but uh, it can be an opportunity to say, what are we going to try? What are we going to do differently? <laughs> and um, and see what you can come up with to help kids get through this tough time. And I think you're right. You know, when I was speaking to parents, a lot of them had anxieties themselves around coming out of the pandemic. Can we say that yet? I don't know. <laughs> coming out of the pandemic, <laughs> um, but just really things becoming, going back to normal and you I, you really um, hit that on the mark because the parents seem to be bringing their anxieties on their children, not all of them, but the parents I spoke with. So they were saying that their child is anxious, but then when you speak to them, the parent had a lot of struggles during the past few years. And obviously we know that the environment will have an impact on the child. And if parents weren't supported, and like you said, wearing 35 hats in terms of what they have to do and the responsibilities, that's a lot of stress within the household. And that means that we won't deal with their child or support them in the way that we they need um which could come out as bigger emotions and some behavioral issues that's just it and i think until things settle down even a little bit more it's to be expected because a lot of parents are stressed out and they're struggling with with financial things and catching up on issues that uh had to be set aside during the pandemic and so as long as families are stressed and parents are stressed kids feel that too and they know that things are kind of weird still so i think until a lot of that settles down Mm-hmm. I mean, the kids may struggle for a little while. 
Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'd love to hear about what's coming up with you uh, in terms of projects or books. I think you have a workbook coming out. I'd love to share that with everybody if, if I'm right. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, so uh, <laughs> it's been almost 10 years since my first book came out, 13 Things mm-hmm. Mentally Strong People Don't Do. Mm-hmm. But kind of the world has changed a lot in the last <laughs> decade. And so many people were just like, I need more. How do I learn more about Mm -hmm. mental strength? So now 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, the workbook, Mm -hmm. goes on sale in February. And it's really lots of just hands-on exercises, a great way for people to build self-awareness with quizzes and checklists and filling questions and um, exercises straight from my therapy office. Because whereas my original book was about what they don't do, mentally strong people, this one is going to be about what you don't do. So I really wanted people to then say, okay, how do I apply these things to my life? And if I'm struggling with this, what can I do instead? I love that. And can you talk just a little bit about your, the book that I see behind you with the kids? I haven't had a chance to read that one yet. Who, or how does a parent know that this might be a good book for their child as well? Oh yeah. So this one was, was so fun to write. I had always (laughs) wanted to write a kid's book, but I kind of didn't know how, but we wrote it for the eight to 12 year old range and it's 13 things strong kids do. And my niece said, uh, Ani Aim, we get told what not to do all the time. Can you just tell us what to do, please? <laughs> I said, I will. I'll write a book Make about it easy. what to do. Yeah. <laughs> but it's all about the same things, about perseverance and gratitude and practicing so many skills that, again, as parents, we don't always know what to mm. how to teach them. And so in a really kid-friendly way, I just wanted kids to know, how do you name your emotions? Oh, how, what do you, you. do yes. when you're thinking negative thoughts? How do you talk back to those thoughts in your own head so you can say, no, I, I can do this? And how do you take some kind of positive action? How do you be brave when nobody else is, is stepping up? How do you be brave when you're scared to do something, but it's a good idea and you want to do it anyway? And again just to see kids like I get kids that review the book and they'll send me little notes and it's probably the most rewarding thing I have ever done in my life is to get these notes and pictures and there's this one kid that um my favorite story is the uh, parents had read my parenting book and decided to implement uh, some of the strategies from that and part of it was helping the child to become more responsible and she really wanted a bunny and um she was able to, to do all this stuff and she earned a bunny and then there's a picture of the, the kid and she's reading my kid book with her bunny in her lap. And they said, the reason she has that bunny is because we were in her parenting book. And she was so oh. excited to learn that you had a kid's book. Oh. That was just like, hey, to come full circle and so yeah. excited to see that. I love that. My kids are a little younger, but I'm definitely going to get that. I have a three, five and seven year old. So seven oh, nice. getting close to that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Amy, for taking the time to chat with me today. I will put the the links to all your books and your podcast so that everybody can share um, the knowledge that you are sharing with them and your Instagram as well. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with us that I haven't maybe mentioned? Um, I would just yet? say for all of us, we're stronger than we think. Your brain will doubt you. It will try to talk you out of doing stuff, but you can do way more than you think that you're capable of. That is so true. Thank you so much. I hope we get to chat again soon. Oh, me too. Thanks for having me.